Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on effective implementation of targeted financial sanctions in Zambia, organized jointly by Fintelect and the Financial Intelligence Center Zambia. My name is Shirish Pathak, and I head Fintelect, which is a research, training, and advisory company focused on AML, CFT, and financial crime compliance. We started working in this area around 15 years back, around 2005. And since then, our work has impacted banks, regulators, FIUs, and other reporting entities, not just where we are based in India, but across over 35 countries globally. To democratize access to AML safety training, we have also recently launched Fintelect Academy, which provides on-demand access to more than 100 educational videos on AML CFT. Today, we have over 200 registered participants representing 92 unique institutions institutions from Zambia, uh, as well as a few other countries from the sectors of banking, financial services, insurance, digital payments, law firms, microfinance, money exchanges, regulators, associations, and of course, the government. At the outset, let me thank Difa Tembo, Director of Compliance and Prevention Department, as well as the Financial Intelligence Center Zambia for supporting this webinar on this important topic and inviting a large number of reporting and and regulatory organizations to participate. In order to comply with and effectively implement the domestic regulations around TFS, that is targeted financial sanctions, as well as help the country to stay compliant with international standards, reporting entities in Zambia must stay current on financial sanctions and be able to understand the impact of these sanctions to their present compliance program. So the objective of today's session is really to bring out more awareness and knowledge about TFS so that all stakeholders can enhance their knowledge to successfully implement these measures. This session will also enable questions from the participants to the FIC. So I would encourage each one of you to take advantage of this opportunity. Let me quickly explain the flow of the webinar today. We will first have an opening speech by Difa Tembo uh, from the FIC. This will be followed by a presentation by Nicholas Turner of Council Steptoe and Johnson Hong Kong and an internationally recognized sanctions expert. After this presentation, I will have an open dialogue with Brent Estrella, group head and chief compliance officer at the Rizal Commercial Banking Corporation based in the Philippines. And we'll ask him to share his views around certain issues related to targeted financial sanctions. Finally, we will open up the floor to questions from the audience. I would therefore request participants to post their questions in the Q&A window as the webinar progresses so that we we can request the speakers to address these questions later. I'm also happy to announce that all those attending today will receive a participation certificate jointly issued by Fintelect and FIC Zambia. To get the certificate, please make a free registration on fintelect.academy after this webinar is over, and you will receive the certificate within seven days at the same email ID that you use to register at the academy. We will also put instructions in the chat box for this later during the webinar, and you will also receive a a follow-up email from Fintelect on instructions on how to get the certificate. With that, let me introduce our first speaker, Deepak Tembo. And although I'm sure he needs no introduction in Zambia because all of you know him, let me just say a few words about him. So Deepak is an economist by profession and holds a master's degree in economics from the University of Manchester. He is a member of the AML CFT National Task Force of Senior Officials, where he serves as secretariat. He's also a trained AML CFT assessor under the SMLAC, that is the Eastern and Southern Africa Anti-Money Laundering Group, which is one of the nine FATF style regional bodies around the world. With this, Difat, may I invite you to present your thoughts? Thank you very much, uh, Sirish, uh, for those um, uh, remarks. And I want to welcome everyone that is joining us uh, today for this very important uh, session. And um, I would like to really uh, recognize invited participants from the National and Terrorism Center, Zambia, the Financial Intelligence Center, uh, quite a number of supervisor authorities that are also joining us this uh, morning from where we are, and of course, a number of uh, reporting entities that Shirish has already uh, mentioned. I would uh, here with like to warmly welcome you to this uh, important workshop 
jointly uh, organized by the Financial Intelligence Center and the FITLEC Advisory Services of India on the effective implementation of targeted financial uh, sanctions. Uh, I wish at the outset extend our sincere gratitude to the Managing Director of FINTLEC Advisory Services, Mr. Shirik, uh, for having provided us with uh, eminent facilitators, Nicholas Turner and Brett Estrera, to partake their experiences with us during this call. Uh, distinguished invited participants, this workshop forms part of the Financial Intelligence Center's outreach program especially uh, or rather specifically designed to enable competent authorities and reporting entities. Uh, in this case, we are talking about financial institutions and designated non-financial businesses and professionals to better understand their anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism and proliferation obligations. So far as implementation of targeted financial sanctions are concerned. Uh, this webinar colleagues uh, further seeks to provide a platform for gathering and sharing experiences, challenges and best practices in the effective implementation of uh, targeted financial sanctions. As most of you are aware, the United Nations has in the past and present continued to impose a number of sanctions. Uh, while sanctions are important tools in the hands of the international community to promote international peace and security, some of these sanctions have been condemned for causing excessive uh, uh, suffering to civilians, populations, or inflicting economic damage on uh, third states. To address these uh, uh, trepidations, the concept of targeted sanctions was developed. Okay, targeted financial sanctions are designed to focus on groups of persons responsible for the breaches of peace or threats to international peace and uh, security. Most of us, especially those uh, from the financial sector, sector are aware that the term targeted uh, financial sanctions means both asset freezing and uh, prohibitions to prevent funds or other assets from being made available, direct or indirect for the benefit of designated persons and entities. These requirements, colleagues, have been made mandatory by the Financial Action Task Force, which is a global standard setter on AMO CFT matters. Countries or indeed jurisdictions are required to implement these sanctions to comply with the United Nations Security Council resolutions relating to the prevention and suppression of terrorism and terrorist financing, as well as the prevention, suppression, and disruption of proliferation of weapons of uh, mass destruction and its uh, financing. Uh, the UN sanctions regime was first established by the resolution, United Nations Security Council Resolution 1267 uh, of 1999. Uh, United Nations Security Council imposes a number of measures against individuals and, en and entities associated with Al-Qaeda. The sanctions regimes have been further strengthened and modified by a number of subsequent resolutions. The measures that are supposed to be implemented by countries according to the resolutions include asset freeze, and this is very critical for us, travel ban and arms embargo in respect of individuals designated by the UN Sanctions Committee. In addition, the resolutions provide for procedures for the listing and delisting of uh, individuals, access to funds or basic and extraordinary expenses protection of rights of third parties, among other issues. Also issue is really how uh, countries implementing these uh, uh, requirements. On the other hand, targeted financial sanctions related to the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction is an international standard introduced by the Financial Action Task Force under the FATF 40 recommendations published in February 2012. Under this standard, jurisdictions are required to implement targeted financial sanctions without delay. And that's another uh, concept that has always been debated by various countries. What does without delay mean? And I guess this training will, will dive and answer and see whether countries 
would really comply with that requirement, okay? And uh, the whole issue is that uh, there should be prevention, suppression and disruption of the proliferation of weapons of mass destructions and its financing. The United Nations Security uh, Council has imposed sanctions on individuals and entities involved in the proliferation of weapons of mass destructions activities through the following resolution. One of them, most of you are aware, is the resolution 2231 of 2015 relating to the Islamic Republic of Iran. The other resolution is 1718 of 2006, 1874 of 2009, 2087 of 2013, 2094 of 2013, and 2270 of 2016 and their successors relating to the to the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. And this is one of the issues that is very interesting when we are dealing with targeted financial sanctions against entities or individuals from this uh, uh, jurisdiction. As uh, a member of the United Nations and Eastern and Southern Africa anti-money laundering group, Zambia is uh, committed to protecting its financial uh, services sector from abuse to this end the country has given effect to sanctions regime under the UN Security Council resolution, as well as the Financial Action Task Force recommendation six and seven. And so recommendation six focuses on uh, targeted financial sanctions related to terrorism and terrorist, terrorist financing. And uh, recommendation seven focuses on uh, targeted financial sanctions um, uh, related to proliferation financing. And so these have been taken care through the enactment of the Anti-Terrorism and Non-Proliferation Act number no. six of 2018 and the regulations which were issued in 2017. The implementation of the sanction lists in, in, is enforced by the National Anti-Terrorism Center, which has the mandate to implement these resolutions in terms of the listing and delisting of designated persons or entities and facilitating the receipt and dissemination of sanctions list to the uh, institutions that are supposed to implement these uh, uh, sanctions. I should mention here that we got colleagues, uh, officials from the National Anti-Terrorism uh, uh, Center or on this call and uh, probably they can shed more light on the, these issues should there be questions that uh, may be asked related to that um, aspect of implementation. The National Terrorism Center has uh, issued guidelines on how to access and uh, implement the sanctions list to the supervisor authorities or reporting entities and other stakeholders. Zambia has in the recent past, just for us to continue working on this issue, We've collaborated with the UN panel of experts to strengthen the system to guard against North Korea entities and individuals operating in Zambia. It is imperative, uh, colleagues, uh, for financial institutions and uh, DFNBPs to have adequate policies, and this is very much emphasized, and procedures, systems, and controls in place to enable them to, to, among others, identify the existing accounts, immediately freeze any identified funds and other assets held or controlled by designated persons and entities, prevent designated persons and entities from conducting transactions with, in, or through them. These requirements are very critical because as countries, if we do not adhere, to these requirements, it's not on the institution that can be sanctioned, but even as a country, we can be sanctioned. The question is, to what extent are the institutions in Zambia and indeed other countries that are joining us this morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are joining us from, effectively implementing these targeted uh, financial sanctions uh, obligations? This training colleagues will endeavor to address this paramount question and provide an opportunity for us to exchange ideas. On this note, our colleagues, senior officials that are joining us from different uh, jurisdictions, Zambia in particular, allow me, dear 
colleagues, participants, to leave the floor now to our panel of our distinguished speakers who guide us on the implementation of these obligations. And I wish you all a successful workshop with many new ideas, insights, and uh, conclusion. Zikomo Kwambiri, thank you very much for your attention. Over to you, Shirish. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak, uh, for those opening remarks. Uh, uh, you know, I'm sure that's going to be very, very useful in setting the uh, tone of the discussion and it's going to it's given us given a lot of inputs to uh, our speakers who are going to be uh, sharing their knowledge now. Uh, before we uh, move on, uh, let me just uh, run a quick poll. Uh, we have a couple of polls uh, which we're going to run through this webinar to find out the sentiment uh, around TFS. So here's the first one, uh, which says, uh, are you aware of the guidelines around targeted financial sanctions issued by the National Terrorism Center of Zambia? We would very much appreciate if you could answer uh, this. Maybe we keep it on for about 30 seconds. In a few seconds, we'll also see the result of the poll. So we will know what everybody's opinion is on this point. So here are the uh, results. Uh, Deepad, uh, any comments on this? I think the, the results are quite uh, uh, a reflection of what is happening in Zambia. Um, you, we, we didn't expect a lot of people to be aware about these uh, uh, guidelines. Like I've mentioned that um, uh, before, Shris, in our background uh, uh, discussions, that uh, we are trying to improve the implementation of targeted financial sanctions in this country. And like I mentioned, when we were evaluated in 2018 uh, uh, through the Eastern and Southern Africa anti-money laundering, we were not compliant, for instance, with uh, targeted financial sanctions related to proliferation financing. And we were partially compliant with targeted financial sanctions related to terrorism and uh, terrorist financing. So the country is now working very uh, much hard to make sure that we put in place uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, issues or real measures, control that will help us as a country to, to comply with those standards. Now you can imagine if the country is not compliant, what more the accountable institution. There's this gap, hence this training is very, very critical and I would definitely urge all participants not to leave because even if you're not compliant with the standards, but if on the ground you are implementing these requirements, then that is what is more critical when it comes to effectiveness. So I expected those results to be the way they are. Right, excellent, excellent. Uh, great. Uh, okay, so uh, Deepa, thank you so much again. I hope you're going to be around for the entire session so that if you get any questions, you'll be there uh, to address them. Um, yeah, uh, so our next uh, presenter is Nicholas Turner. Uh, before I invite uh, Nick for his presentation, presentation, let me again say a few words about him so that you get to know him better. Uh, so Nick Turner, uh, based in Hong Kong, uh, he works with multinational financial institutions and corporations across the United States, European Union, Hong Kong and China, Singapore, Australia, and other jurisdictions in Asia uh, on all aspects of economic sanctions, AML, anti-bribery and corruption compliance and investigations. Um, prior to joining STEPTO, Nick served as a regional sanctions compliance officer based in Hong Kong for a US-based multinational financial institution after completing the bank's two-year compliance management associate program in New York and California. Nick has experience advising on a wide range of financial services, including commercial and retail banking, credit cards, trade finance, capital markets, and digital services, amongst others. Drawing on his in-house experience, he focuses on guiding clients on designing and implementing practical and risk 
practice-based compliance programs and advising on the application of regulations from the US Department of Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Control and other agencies to the client's international business. Also in 2020, last year, he was named to the Global Investigations Reviews list of 40 under 40 Global Investigation Specialists. With that, Nick, welcome to the webinar and may we have your presentation, please. Shreesh, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. It's a great honor to be here today and to share some information with you. I'm going to uh, share my screen and you should see a presentation. Shreesh, if you could confirm, please, if that's visible. Yes, it's, it's visible, it's fine. Absolutely, wonderful. Uh, I'm gonna break my presentation into three parts. Uh, the first part is going to reinforce uh, some of the information that Mr. Tembo just shared with us about the international framework for targeted financial sanctions. The second part is going to provide some typologies or some typical examples of how financial institutions encounter targeted financial sanctions issues in their operations. And finally, I'm going to offer some resources and examples of guidance documents that you can consult for more information. And of course, at the end of the session today, when we have our Q&A period, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. I'll begin by talking about, very briefly, the FATF recommendations uh, related to targeted financial sanctions, with as we heard come from the 40 recommendations on combating money laundering and the financing of terrorism and proliferation. <clears throat> now, as you know, the FATF recommendations call on each country to perform a national risk assessment in which the country assesses the nation's uh, risk for all sorts of money laundering and terrorist financing issues in particular for the purpose of today's discussion, terrorist financing and proliferation sanctions. There's a mutual evaluation process which takes place on a periodic basis, which is either carried out by FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, or one of several FATF style regional bodies. In the case of Zambia, your FATF style regional body is the Eastern and Southern Africa Anti-Money Laundering Group, and they performed recently a mutual evaluation and produced a very comprehensive report, uh, which you could read online uh, to get some information about the country's performance against these recommendations. Key for today's discussion are two of the 40 recommendations, recommendation six and recommendation seven. These relate to the implementation of targeted financial sanctions in relation to two broad issues. Recommendation six concerns targeted financial sanctions related to terrorism and terrorist financing. Recommendation seven relates to targeted financial sanctions concerning proliferation. As we just heard, Zambia approaches these two issues slightly differently. Uh, however, as we'll see, there's information about both issues available on the relevant websites. Recommendation six and recommendation seven are worded uh, basically the same. They call on uh, all FATF participants to implement UN Security Council resolutions related to terrorism sanctions and to proliferation sanctions, and within their national legal systems to have mechanisms to freeze without delay funds or other assets, and to ensure that funds or other assets are not made available to the individuals or entities which are targeted by these sanctions. To provide a different view of how this process works, we can think of the international system for financial sanctions as having multiple layers. And I like to think of it as having basically four layers, beginning with the UN Security Council, 
which is empowered under Chapter 7, Article 41 of the UN Charter to adopt sanctions in response to threats to international peace and security. The second layer are sanctions committees. Now these are part of the UN Security Council, but they actually help to perform the work of the Security Council in identifying targets of sanctions and in assessing the effectiveness of sanctions and of member states implementation of those sanctions. The third layer are national governments. Under the UN Charter, it is the member states of the United Nations who are responsible for implementing UN sanctions through their national laws and regulations. So in each country, which is a member state, we'll have a different system for implementing UN Security Council resolutions, but we would expect to see those resolutions implemented somehow in each of the member state countries. So whether we're talking about Zambia or we're talking about Hong Kong or the United States or some other jurisdiction in the world, we should be able to find some information about how UN Security Council sanctions are implemented locally. Now the fourth and final layer, which is most important for today's discussion are regulated persons. These are the individuals or the entities which are regulated under domestic laws and regulations and are responsible for following those laws and regulations in respect of the targeted financial sanctions. So for example, financial institutions in Zambia, they have responsibilities under local law to implement UN Security Council resolutions, to screen against sanctions lists, and to freeze assets and other economic resources that are tied to the targets of those sanctions. So a fairly simple framework, but one which is universal, uh, which is uh, consistent, and which is reinforced through the FATF recommendations. If we wanted to look at an example, we could consider Resolution 1718 from 2006. This is related to North Korea or the DPRK, depending on how you like to call it. And there are currently 80 individuals and 75 entities which have been placed on the UN sanctions list by the committee established pursuant to Resolution 1718. So here we have the first two layers of the four layers, which I discussed on the previous slide. We have the UN Security Council, which has issued a resolution, and we have a committee, which is responsible for identifying targets of those sanctions, and they've identified several dozen targets. I've provided a screenshot here of an example of one of the targets of those sanctions, an individual called Yun Ho Jin, who appears on the UN sanctions list. And if you were to visit the UN Security Council's website, you would be able to get information about the reasons why that individual was sanctioned and other material that the Security Council and the committee has found relevant. Then if we were to go down to the third layer, which is the national level, we can see that the Financial Intelligence Center of Zambia has provided on its website PDFs of the UN sanctions lists, which can be consulted by the public and the regulated institutions within the country. And if we were to go to the file that has the consolidated UN sanctions list, we would find that individual, Yun Ho Jin, listed right there in the file. Of course, the National Anti-Terrorism Center also distributes lists within the country that fall under Recommendation 6, which are the UN Security Council resolutions related to anti-terrorism measures. So you can see that you have that national implementation and distribution of information that is made available to the regulated persons who are then responsible for implementing those sanctions within their internal controls and compliance programs. So that's a very basic view of the overview and how that information flows from the UN Security Council down to the level of the regulated persons. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the international framework. I think you guys understand it very well. What I really want to talk about today are some of these typologies, 
which are based on cases that I've worked on and on well-known enforcement examples from different regulators around the world. So on the next slide, uh, what I've presented for your consideration is a very basic typology that I'm going to talk through. And then on the next two slides, I'm going to make it a little bit more complicated. And what I want to consider in this discussion are the challenges that financial institutions face in trying to identify the targets of sanctions so that they can not only freeze their assets which are under their control, but also interdict and prevent transactions either within the country or internationally, which could breach the relevant sanctions. So in this example, I'd like you to put yourself in the shoes of a compliance officer who's at Bank A. So the stories that I'm going to tell are going to be from the perspective of Bank A. And you'll see on each of the slides a yellow starburst. Uh, and that's where the transaction, which is conducted by Bank A, intersects with another bank, which I've proposed is an international correspondent bank. So in these examples, we're going to be looking at international transactions, which cause violations of international sanctions. But these examples don't have to be international, they could also be domestic. We're also going to see on each of the slides an orange box, which will have the sanctioned person. Now that could be an individual or an entity, but it's somebody who's been identified on a sanctions list. And in these examples, we'll be thinking about UN sanctions. They could be sanctioned under any of the UN Security Council resolutions, which would create the obligation uh, to identify and prevent their transactions. And then at the end, we'll always have Bank B, and Bank B is going to be the intended recipient of the transaction, which is being originated at Bank A. So in this example, typology one, it's very simple, very straightforward. I call this the directly sanctioned customer. This is where Bank A has onboarded an individual or an entity whose name appears on a sanctions list. And we'll assume for the purpose of this example that that's a true match that all of the identifying information about that person is consistent with the information that appears on the sanctions list. And what has happened in this typology is that Bank A, while having that customer, has originated a transaction on behalf of that customer, which is intended for a individual or entity at Bank B, and it's been stopped by the international correspondent who has screened the transaction and identified the involvement of a sanctioned person. Now, the reason I like to highlight this type of typology is because in my practice advising financial institutions, it is often that international transactions are the transactions that cause sanctions violations. They are the transactions which draw the attention of regulatory authorities, and which most often lead to investigations and enforcement actions. So from the point of view of Bank A, it is critically important that they identify these transactions and prevent the transactions before they enter the international financial system, because Bank A not only wants to comply with the sanctions, but also wants to avoid external scrutiny. So the different questions that I would ask in trying to determine how Bank A was able to cause this violation would be listed at the bottom of the slide. And I would begin with the regulatory question. I would ask, was Bank A required under local regulation to screen against the relevant list? In other words, has the national government of Bank A's country implemented the UN sanctions in accordance with the FATF recommendations, whether recommendation six or recommendation seven. So that's always a key question. The next one has to do with Bank A's internal controls. And I would wonder if Bank A had implemented the required screening. That means is Bank A using that sanctions list, which has been made available to Bank A to screen its customers? 
But most importantly, is it doing that screening periodically? Is it repeating the screening on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis? Some repetition is required in order to identify existing customers who may have been added to a sanctions list after they were onboarded as a customer. I would also consider the data quality. Did Bank A have sufficient and quality data about its customer in order to identify that the customer was sanctioned? So in onboarding the customer, did Bank A follow the correct procedures and all of the regulatory requirements and identify the correct identifying information, whether that was a date of birth or an address, a passport, a business registration number, or all of the other information which could be made available on a sanctions list and which can be used to identify sanctions targets. I would also think about Bank A's system. Was Bank A's screening system effectively designed and tested? Now, Bank A may decide to use a manual screening approach where individuals at the bank actually type in information into a screening system, or Bank A may decide to use an automated system where sanctions lists are compared against customer data and alerts are generated for the bank's review. It doesn't matter what approach it takes, but that system has to be tested and it has to be effective. Training and resources is also critically important. Bank's A staff has to correctly and timely disposition these potential hits. What I mean by this is that Bank A is going to have a screening process, which could be manual or it could be automated, but it's going to be generating information that Bank A's staff will need to review. And the staff has to have adequate training and understanding of sanctions in order to correctly compare the information that they're receiving from their systems against the information provided by the United Nations or the local government and can correctly treat that information in order to identify the sanctioned person. So many issues in banks and other companies arise because the staff do not have the knowledge or the skills necessary to handle these issues when they occur. And finally is execution. The question I would ask is whether or not Bank A identified all of the accounts of the sanctioned person and did it place blocks or holds or freezes on those accounts? So for instance, if Bank A identified a single deposit account for the sanctioned person and froze that account, did Bank A also search other systems to see if there might be other accounts which are associated with the sanctioned person? And were all of the relevant accounts placed under a similar hold? So, it's important that these controls are implemented in a comprehensive fashion and that they're executed in a thorough manner so that all of the economic resources or assets which are under the bank's control are subject to the same level of compliance. So that's your typical, very basic typology. I'm sure many of you have encountered cases involving sanctioned customers and you would know exactly how to handle this and you would have an effective system in place in order to identify and prevent these transactions. But let's make it a little bit more complicated. Let's look at typology two. In typology two, what we're dealing with is not a directly sanctioned customer. We're dealing with a customer who has a beneficial owner who is sanctioned. And the reason this is important is because under many national laws and regulations, legal entities which are owned or controlled by sanctioned persons are also treated as sanctioned. So Bank A would have a responsibility in this case to know that its customer, who is a legal entity, is owned or controlled by a UN sanctioned beneficial owner. So you would know that under the local requirements in Zambia, the financial institution would have to identify the beneficial owners of its legal entity customers. And those legal entities customers, beneficial owners should also be subject to the same screening controls as the customer itself. So 
in addition to identifying and gathering that information and verifying the information about the beneficial owners, those names should be put through the same automated or manual screening process and any potential hits should be dispositioned by Bank A staff and the legal entity should also be subject to restrictions if it's determined that the beneficial owner is on the UN sanctions list. Now this is challenging for a lot of banks because the beneficial ownership information is not always complete, it's not always up to date, and in some banks it's not subject to the same level of screening. Now that may because they may be because of an issue in the way that the procedures are designed or it could actually be a system issue where the data is not subject to the screening system. But this is an issue that banks really need to focus on and solve. You might be aware of an enforcement case from the United States from several years ago involving Barclays Bank. Barclays had a subsidiary in Zimbabwe and that entity in Zimbabwe was processing transactions through the international financial system it turned out that the customers of the bank were owned by sanctioned persons. And so the bank should not have been processing those international transactions. But because of the way it had designed its screening systems, the information about the beneficial owners was not actually being screened adequately. And so they weren't able to identify and prevent those transactions. So if you're looking for an example that you'd like to study, you can go to the US Treasury Department's website under the Office of Foreign Assets Control or OFAC, and you can look for that Barclays case, and it will provide a very thorough description, which will help you understand this issue a little bit better. So when I'm looking at a case like this involving a beneficial owner, I would ask similar questions to what I asked in the earlier example with the directly sanctioned customer but I would be thinking specifically about how the bank approaches beneficial ownership information. I would want to know whether or not Bank A had actually gathered sufficient information about the beneficial owners, whether that information was subject to screening, and whether or not the bank had that data available to the screening system. And then of course, I would think about execution. So after identifying the beneficial owner, did Bank A apply controls to all of the relevant accounts? It's often the case that if you have a beneficial owner who has a legal entity with one account at a bank, they may have other accounts. And so it's important to search across the whole customer database in order to identify potentially linked accounts that would also need to be subject to control. So those cases are a little bit more complicated, but they're not as complicated as typology three, which I think is the most difficult one to uh, solve, but it's very important, especially when you're dealing with intermediaries. So in typology three, what we have is the same UN sanctioned customer. We also have bank A, and we have that international transaction which is taking place. But rather than having some kind of direct relationship with the sanctioned customer, Bank A only has a relationship with the intermediary. Now that intermediary could be a money service business. It could be an exchange house. It could be a trading company. It could be another financial institution. It could be a law office or an accounting firm. It's somebody who is transacting on behalf of another person and they're using Bank A's international correspondent account in order to carry out that transaction. The reason this is so difficult for Bank A is because Bank A normally would not have access to information about the intermediary's customers. Bank A might not even be entitled to that information. And even if they received the information, it might be too late. The transaction may already have taken place. So what Bank A should be thinking about, in my opinion, is whether or not the intermediary has adequate controls of its own in order to identify customers which are sanctioned and whether or not that intermediary is committed to compliance with the relevant sanctions. Usually banks will approach this in a risk-based manner. 
which means that they will look at the customers that they have and they will consider if they're higher risk. And if they're higher risk, then they will perform additional due diligence and they will require more compliance out of that intermediary. So if you think of a casino, for example, that has an account with a financial institution, the financial institution is probably going to ask the casino a lot of questions about the quality of their compliance program. And one of the reasons why is because Bank A wants to be comfortable that that casino is not going to be using their account to transmit funds on behalf of sanctioned individuals or for other reasons which would be prohibited. The same thing is true of money service businesses or other financial institutions. Of course, if you have a lower risk customer, you may not apply the same level of control and that's perfectly fine under a risk-based approach. But I think in the beginning, looking for higher risk intermediaries is a good place to start. Now, under most uh, laws and regulations, if this kind of violation were to occur, the intermediary would probably be the one who is held responsible or liable under the law. But I still think Bank A would have some exposure because they may end up being involved in an investigation uh, or they may need to supply information to law enforcement in order to investigate the customer that was acting on behalf of that UN sanctioned person. So the questions I would ask in this case, first beginning with regulation, was the intermediary subject to local regulation that required screening? So for example, is that intermediary a financial institution which is subject to similar regulations as Bank A? Or are we talking about the type of company that isn't really regulated and would not have a specific obligation? So that's one way of approaching that. As I mentioned before, I would also think about due diligence. That means did Bank A identify that intermediary as being higher risk? And did Bank A apply appropriate due diligence and controls to that relationship in order to prevent these types of transactions? And then finally, internal controls. Did Bank A have any information about the intermediary's customer or its transactions that would have allowed it to identify this example. So from time to time, banks are provided with uh, net settlement reports or uh, trade documents or other types of information that provides them some insight into what their customers are doing. And in those cases, the bank should review that information to try to determine if their intermediary is engaging in high-risk transactions. And that's information that Bank A can use in its monitoring and in its sanctions compliance program. So those are the three examples uh, that I think about when I think about compliance with targeted financial sanctions. They're different in the challenges that they posed to the financial institution and the strategies that you need to address them are slightly different. But I think because of the risk that we're all facing, because of the importance of the international sanctions, and because of the bank's desire to comply with those sanctions and to avoid scrutiny from regulators or other law enforcement agencies, it's very important that they have adequate controls for identifying each of these three typologies in their operations. Now, I talked a little bit about a risk-based approach. What I mean by that is that the bank is going to assess the risk of its operations based on a number of factors. Those factors include its customers, the types of customers they are, the types of business that they operate in, and so on, as well as the customer supply chains and counterparties. The bank is going to be thinking about products and services and delivery channels, as well as the geographies where it's operating. And by taking those elements and assessing them and weighing them, the company should be able to identify where its greatest risks are so that it can apply the highest level of control to the areas of risk. That's what a risk-based approach means. And I give just a simple example. If you have a company that is exporting commodities to a place like Dandong, China, which is on the border with North Korea, and it's paying for those goods in US dollars, you're going to have a higher level of risk 
than if you're talking about a company that is buying toys from a domestic factory and it's paying for those in Quacha. You're going to apply a higher level of control and monitoring to the first example than you would the second example. And under most regulatory systems, that would be a reasonable approach because it takes into account the risk. If you'd like some additional guidance, I'm gonna share some information about two documents, uh, which I often consult. The first one is from the US Treasury Department. Now this is not uh, directly applicable to banks in Zambia. You're not subject to US Treasury Department regulations under most circumstances, uh, but it still provides some helpful guidance that I think banks can take into account when they're designing their compliance controls. This is a document that was released in 2019, and it's called the Framework for OFAC Compliance Commitments. And what's really nice about this document is that it lays out the elements of an effective sanctions compliance program and breaks them into five elements. Senior management commitment, sanctions risk assessment, internal controls, testing and auditing, and training. And it gives some information about what those controls can look like and some of the pitfalls that uh, companies sometimes fall into when they don't have adequate compliance programs. What's also nice about these five elements is that they're the same five elements that you would find in a strong AML compliance program. So you can really marry your sanctions and AML compliance strategies together and in many cases rely on the same systems and the same staff or other resources in order to make that efficient uh, for your uh, institution. The last document is from the Wolfsburg Group, which is a international group of financial institutions which have come together to develop guidance uh, for financial institutions primarily uh, on different AML and CFT issues. Although this is focused on compliance uh, for financial institutions, I think the advice that they give is applicable to all kinds of companies. So I like to consult this document. It was also released in 2019. It's called the Guidance on Sanctions Screening. It's very easy to find if you Google that. And it provides recommendations for implementing implementing risk-based sanctions screening as part of an overall financial crimes compliance program. What I like about the Wolfsburg Group is that they approach this issue from the point of view of the private sector. They're really thinking about this from the point of view of the financial institutions, which are members of the Wolfsburg Group. And so a lot of the recommendations that they give are pretty common sense and they're focused on efficiency and making sure that AML CFT is effective, but efficient. So some of the things the document touches on is making sure that sanction screening is part of an effective wider sanctions compliance program. So it's not the only control. There are many controls that the, the financial institution or company would have and sanction screening is just one of them. It recognizes that there are limitations to sanction screening. It doesn't solve every problem. So sanction screening uh, can be used to uh, identify the names of potential targets, but you wouldn't use it, for example, for monitoring for some of these typologies. And it notes that a risk-based approach can be appropriate. So we don't need to apply the same level of control to all of our operations we're going to be looking for the areas of highest risk and focusing our controls and our resources on those areas of highest risk. And it says, and I like this quote a lot, while sanction screening is a primary control, it has its limitations and should be deployed alongside a broader set of non-screening controls to be truly effective. So that means, for example, that team members need to have adequate job-specific training they need to be aware of red flags and they need to be encouraged to identify and escalate those red flags for further investigation by the FCC team. So we're thinking of sanction screening as part of an overall program. So those are uh, the slides that I hope to share today and the key information. Again, I wanted to talk about that overall international framework 
those typologies and the guidance. And I hope together it gives you um, some ideas for how to approach targeted financial sanctions within your own company. So with that, Trish, I'm happy to turn it back over to you. And thanks again for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nick, for this presentation. Uh, very enlightening as usual. And I'm sure it was, uh, it's going to be very useful uh, for the audience that we have. And for all of you attending, you may be interested to know that Nick releases a monthly video update on sanctions, which is published exclusively for FinTech and is free to view on FinTech Academy in the first week of every month. So if you want to keep up with sanctions, register on FinTech Academy and watch Nick's video in the first week of every month. It's a short 10 to 15 minute video, but gives you a quick snapshot on what's happening in the world of sanctions. Before I invite Brett to uh, get into the discussion, let's run another quick poll. Uh, Arpita, can we have the poll, please? So this poll says, what are the three most important challenges faced by your institution at the moment with respect to sanction screening? We'll keep this on for about 30 seconds. All right, so we've closed the poll. Uh, panelists, would you like to comment on, uh, on the results? These look like uh, responses that you would see in most places. Um, I think lack of technology is always a huge issue. That looks like it's the number one answer. There's a lot of vendors that offer different sanction screening solutions, but they can be costly. It's not always the right answer. Uh, and implementing those systems and making sure that the data is correctly tied into those systems can be a real challenge. So uh, that makes sense to me. Um, and these other issues, of course, are also very typical. So I think everybody's in good company when it comes to these issues. <laughs> right. Uh, Brent, Difat, any comment on this poll? I think the, the responses are quite good for us as regulators. I think uh, I take uh, feedback uh, seriously, especially on the inadequate guidelines by regulators. I think that comes more like uh, third. Uh, no, is it second or so? Yeah, we have lack of technology, which is uh, really very difficult, especially for small institutions DFNBPs, these are very, very difficult uh, issues to, to comply with. But when it comes to regulators, I think for us, we need to do a lot of work because we may not have the technology, but I think there can be a better way of still do some manual work, still apply the few resources that you have to comply with these standards. So for me, inadequate guidelines by regulators is a good feedback, and we will be working on that to ensure that our accountable institutions are aware of what they're supposed to do. Thanks, from the perspective of a regulated um, institution and uh, from the private um, sector, I think the responses to the survey really resonates um, well um, to the challenges that we face. And I, and I think it's, it cuts across different jurisdictions as well. So it's not something which is jurisdiction specific. And I can say that where I, um, I am from, uh, we are also facing the same challenges. Yeah. Right. All right. Uh, thank you uh, so much, panelists, for your comments on the poll. Um, all right. Uh, let me now uh, get Brent into the discussion. Uh, but before that, let me just say a few words about him so that uh, all of you attending know him a bit better. So Brent Estrella, uh, based in the Philippines currently, brings with him almost two decades 
decades of compliance and risk management experience, which he gained from HSBC across various jurisdictions in Southeast Asia, uh, the Philippines, the Middle East, that is the UAE, and Sub-Saharan Africa, specifically Mauritius. Uh, his uh, you know, areas of expertise focus on financial crime risk and regulatory compliance risk stewardship, compliance monitoring, testing and reviews, risk strategy, oversight and governance, operational risk management, compliance operations across technology and data analytics, cross-functional and multi-jurisdictional project management, organizational development, talent management, and transformation. So that's a huge number of big words in one sentence, Brent. So Brent, thank, thank you, you very so much, Sharice. Uh, yes, thanks Brent, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, you know, uh, I thought to make it interesting, you know, rather than uh, having a PPT as we discussed, let's, uh, you know, have a small Q&A session with you. Uh, sure. So, you know, Brent, uh, so Philippines is in the post-observation period following the third round of mutual evaluation in uh, 2018. And the Philippines FIU, that is the AMLC, has recently introduced new regulations around targeted financial sanctions to improve technical compliance in line with the FATO standards. So could you highlight or, you know, give us some some of the highlights of these regulatory provisions and what key changes uh, that has actually translated into? So um, targeted financial sanctions um, is not new uh, in so far as our regulatory framework is concerned. So it's been something which has already been in place uh, well before um, the fourth round of the mutual evaluation review in the Philippines started in 2018. But I think what happened after that is that our um, regulator, the uh, Anti-Money Laundering Council, realized that there are areas for improvement uh, that will promote operational efficiency and design effectiveness of our controls in order to mitigate uh, the risk. Um, let me just give around uh, five um, uh, you know, points uh, in, re in relation to that in terms of you know, what came new as a result of the mutual evaluation review. So um, in the new uh, guidance on targeted financial sanctions, it's been, ma been made very clear that it is to be incorporated as part of customer due diligence and um, our inherent risk assessments. I think Nick already touched on this during his um, you know, examples earlier, and I think it was very succinctly um, discussed uh, a while ago as well. The AMLC uh, likewise provided more uh, clarity in terms of how freezing of assets is actually to be um, done. And by this, they also have to work with the judiciary um, because they have to work with the courts in terms of having to come out with a new rules of court on uh, asset preservation, seizure, and forfeiture. Because um, you know, when it comes to uh, uh, asset freezing or prohibition in, uh, in dealing, there will definitely be a legal aspect to it. And so the uh, local FIU had to work with um, you know, the judiciary to come up with um, a new rules of court to support us in that regard. The third point I'd like to make is in, with respect to you know, the submission and uh, timeliness of returns. Because um, you know, in the previous guidelines, um, there were uh, already requirements for submission and uh, of returns, but this time it also provided more prescriptive guidelines in terms of how much time do you know banks or other institutions have before a return has to be made, and also in terms of how much time, even in terms of hours, do we have to freeze uh, to temporarily freeze an account that is suspected to be a potential match. Um, a fourth point is uh, with respect to uh, the prohibition uh, of all uh, of um, uh, involving uh, persons, not just the covered persons, which, is, which are the regulated entities here, but even for private persons. Uh, they just have to state it out that, you know, not only banks or uh, DNFBPs or you know NBFIs um, will be required uh, to actually um, you know prevent um, or you know prohibit, but even private persons. So that clarification has to be made. Um, and lastly, 
uh, there was more guidance with respect to the submission of a suspicious transaction report or a suspicious matter report, uh, depending on which regulation or jurisdiction you're from and how it's called, even for attempted transactions. Because I think it's key for the FIU to be given that kind of intel in terms of attempted transactions as well. Right, right. Um, thanks, Brent. So, you know, obviously, uh, there are a couple of challenges you mentioned uh, that this has brought for covered persons. Uh, and for the benefit of the audience, again, uh, when I say covered persons and Brent says covered persons, it is really the reporting entities. Um, so, uh, you know, how is your bank and also, you know, the rest of the banking industry dealing with these challenges? Because, you know, some of your experiences may help uh, the banks listening in, in Zambia to also, you know, uh, figure out how to deal with it. Yeah, so um, I leave aside for now the legal ramifications around asset freezing, and uh, that will be a whole lot of discussion on that. So I'll focus more on the um, operational challenges, which I think is what concerns um, the regulated entities or the covered persons more. Um, definitely number one challenge for us is enhancing our screening systems. You know, what type of data, you know, goes into the system, uh, the quality of the data, uh, the feeds of, that go into the screening systems, those are, you know, important considerations for us. And, um, you know, with the implementation of the targeted financial sanctions um, uh, guidelines, the new ones, we have to also revisit how well are we operating the control as a regulated person. Um, also, with respect to the speed of disposition, because we cannot take too long for us to make a decision whether is it a match or not a match. Um, and the legal framework and the regulatory framework now provides us some level of cover in terms of you know, how we will be able to decide and to, dispos and to disposition that. But definitely speed of disposition is very important because you know, in the air, in the realm of digitalization, where you know uh, payments are moving very fast uh, and assets are being converted from one form to another, uh, we need to make a quick decision, um, and that's an area which I think you know a lot of other players will have to look into as well as they build their own procedures to enable them to do that. Uh, lastly, I'd say with respect to uh, meeting the the reporting requirement because there's a very strict um, you know, guideline now that we have in terms of when do we submit and notify the FIU um, when we have made a temporary freeze or when we have applied a freeze on a particular account or um, you know, a transaction. So that's something that will have to be really you know, considered by the covered person or regulated entity. Right, right. Thanks, Brent. So, Brent, you know, in uh, any country, you know, normally the FIU uh, plays a development role as well as a regulatory role, right? That's what I always say. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I'd like to know what kind of support have you received from the AMLC uh, for implementing the provisions and, you know, especially during the pandemic? Yeah. Um, in, in your um, survey earlier, um, I, I think it actually uh, hit the nail hard in terms of what the FIU has done here to support us, which is really to provide more guidance um, and to engage the industry practitioners uh, in terms of what needs to be done. Setting out the regulatory expectation um, is very helpful because that gives us a clarity and a good visibility in terms of what are we expected to do from our end? And so during this time of pandemic, even though it's very difficult to meet face to face, um, the um, FIU has been very much uh, active providing you know, um, uh, Zoom webinars um, and all types of virtual events. Uh, you're, it's very easy to you know, get them to speak and to uh, engage with us. And there's a lot of bilateral discussions happening between the industry association and our FIU. Right. And, uh, you know, if you look at the entire, uh, let's say, compliance ecosystem, you know, not just the regulator or the uh, reporting entities, you know, what kind of support would you say have you needed from other industry participants? You know, it could be screening or the AML transaction monitoring technology providers, could be consulting firms, could be legal advisors, or even the uh, banking or compliance association in another country. Yeah. 
Um, so I'll touch on just two amongst those uh, uh, entities which you've mentioned. So we work very closely with our screening service provider because it really um, helps that we have a good relationship with them so that they know what are our requirements. Sometimes it, the, the, the discussion has to go down to that level where it also has to be what works for us locally. Um, bear in mind that most of the screening service providers have got international operations and has got, they would have a very international or global mindset. Uh, there are nuances though locally in terms of what we need to be able to achieve. And so our screening service provider has to be open to hear us out um, and work with us as well in terms of uh, being able to implement what is required from our end. Um, the second point I'd like to make with respect to the industry association is that we, we've worked well with you know, the, the Banking Industry Compliance Association, um, organizing uh, you know, um, uh, educational awareness sessions and really getting more participants to, uh, to join um, and to participate in this so that we can have a healthy discussion of what's the, what's the requirement or you know, which areas we think are gray areas and would require more substantiation or clarification from the regulator. Right, right. So, okay, before we start the Q&A, Brent, let me just ask you one more question and then we'll open it up to audience. Sure. Uh, so I remember when we spoke last, I think at our last uh, online session, you mentioned that, uh, you know, your bank, RCBC, has actually entered into a partnership with the Philippines FIU in the area of data sharing for customer and transaction screening. So can you tell us a bit more about this partnership so that banks in Zambia can also possibly think of uh, exploring a similar arrangement there? Yeah, sure. Um, so the RCBC group entered into a, an information sharing protocol agreement with our Anti-Money Laundering Council here. And what, is, what it is, is that it's basically a public-private partnership where we will facilitate a you know, free flow or exchange of information across the regulator and the regulated entity. Um, and we really get the benefit from it because, you know, the FIU is able to share um, information which otherwise would not have been readily available um, in the public domain for us to be able to better discount matches, for example, or for us to even just be uh, able to better investigate uh, what we are seeing from our end. Um, and vice versa, from our end, if we're seeing anything that we believe that would be of uh, critical um, importance to them, then we can always provide that feedback uh, using the suspicious transaction reporting framework as a legal mechanism to protect us as well um, in terms of what we're sharing to our uh, FIU. And uh, we've proven it to be very helpful because as you know, um, the uh, Anti-Terrorism Council would have come out with names now. Sometimes when you go through the list, it's not always um, one apparent that it's an exact match. But because of that information sharing protocol that we have signed with the uh, Anti-Money Laundering Council, it becomes easier for us to reach out to them and ask, can you share more information on this or that persons so that we can better discount the, uh, the match uh, from our end? Um, and we've proven that to be very helpful because uh, they're very much now able to share that using that framework. So it works for us and vice versa, it works for them as well. Right, thank you. Thank you so much, Brent, for uh, you know taking all these questions. I think uh, it's going to be very useful for uh, the banks in Zambia as well as I think for the uh, FIC in Zambia uh, it might you know uh, help to give them as well some uh, new ideas. Uh, Deepak over to you for uh, for your thoughts. All right so thank you very much uh, Sharish. I should say thank you indeed to the institution for putting up all these uh, materials. You work tirelessly to make sure that uh, these uh, events finally comes to pass. We've been planning, you and me, I think you know what we've gone through just to have this uh, session take place. The format uh, along the way probably could have changed, but this was very, very helpful. 
uh, Nick and uh, Brent, thank you very much for that uh, um, uh, insightful kind of uh, information that you have given and the openness for us to reach out to you. And I know institutions and participants will definitely reach out to you, especially that uh, these are not debatable issues. As a country, we committed. As a country, we are really, really committed. As I'm talking right now, uh, various stakeholders are meeting, trying to attend to some of these issues on REC 6 and uh, 7 because we have an obligation to report to the Eastern and Southern African Time Money Rendering Group in September on what we are doing. So this training is part of what we will be reporting on in trying of uh, 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 sharing knowledge and uh, sensitizing our uh, stakeholders. Participants, I know there are quite senior individuals here who are not given an opportunity to talk. I salute you for the time that you took from your biz offices, MDs and OCOs, reporting entities, cent uh, central bank uh, here, uh, a law association of Zambia. I know the president, I was talking to him, he said he's gonna join. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good platform, which attracted quite a number of um, senior officials. And this is the seriousness that the country is uh, giving to these issues. Once again, Nick, uh, uh, bravo. Thank you very much. And uh, those are my remarks. Colleagues from FIC, Thank you. I know you are busy, but you took time to be part of uh, uh, this session. My, uh, my, my, my DG is also following through and uh, definitely we will ensure that those certificates in, co uh, uh, in conjunction with uh, 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 Shirish uh, reach out to all uh, participants. Thanks. Deepa, thank you so much for that. Uh, Nick and Brent, thank you uh, so much for joining us today and sharing, um, sharing your thoughts, your knowledge. Uh, and as Deepak said, very openly and you know candidly with all all the participants. Uh, participants, thank you so much for a patient listening. Uh, and everyone, let's close this webinar now. Uh, have a great day, and uh, we wish Zambia the very best in its endeavors to be compliant. And as I mentioned earlier, if there is any other such webinar or any other topic, we can be of use. Uh, please feel free to let us know and also look out for all the content available on Contact Academy. Uh, with that, uh, thank you so much and have a great day.